Hi there, my name is Maria Lewis. I'm an assistant curator at ACME, the Australian Centre for Moving Image. And I'm so delighted to be joined by Ryan White, the award-winning filmmaker behind Assassins. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I love Melbourne, so uh, it's my pleasure to talk to you. Well, hopefully once the world is reopened, you can come and visit the museum. We've reopened now. There's lots of shiny toys and film history stuff. I would love to. I've, I've been there a lot and I'm usually, I've been there multiple times for the Australian Open, so I'm watching it like crazy right now on television, but Excellent. obviously can't be there. Firstly, I'm desperate to know what you thought when you first read uh, Doug Bok Clark's GQ feature, The Untold Story of King Yong Nam's Assassination. What, what was going through your mind when you first read that article? And was a film something that you were even thinking about down the line? No, I would love to say that I had, uh, it was my idea to make a film about this. It absolutely was not. And that article, which is an incredible article that everyone should read, I didn't read it. So I didn't know about that article. And the assassination happened February of 2017. So for Americans, that's right as Donald Trump is taking office. I remember the headline you know, assassination of Kim Jong-un's brother, two female assassins, which was so sensational. They were portrayed as these Bond women, you know, femme fatale, black widow assassins. Um, it was very sexy headline. And then it disappeared here because Donald Trump had just totally taken over all of our, all of our media and, and you proved have that to be true, <laughs> uh, unfortunately for the last four years. And so Doug, the journalist that you reference, he approached me in late 2017 and, he had, I had a series that came out on, on Netflix that year called The Keepers, which was extremely popular here. And it sort of been seen as like sensitive true crime. Um, that was sort of the way uh, that The Keepers was, was perceived here by the media at least, was like turning true crime upside down a little bit in that it, it, it didn't focus on the perpetrator and the murder itself. It focused much more on the victims and the social issues that lie beneath. And, Doug had seen that series. And so he called me and said, hey, I'm in Malaysia. I'm covering the assassination of Kim Jong-nam. And I said, oh yeah, I remember that, the two female assassins. And he said, there's a lot more to this story than what has hit the international media. And I think I've seen the keepers and I think you might be interested in it. And I'm very impulsive, uh, very reckless, and, and my, my, my mother would probably say. And a few weeks later, I was so intrigued by that conversation with Doug. Uh, a few weeks later, I was on a flight to Malaysia to meet him there. And it was that trip to Malaysia where I started meeting his sources. And, uh, you know, the murder trial had not started yet. Um, but the idea that two women were admitting that they had assassinated Kim Jong-nam, but were going to be using a defense that they thought they were on a reality show. I thought, I was pretty convinced still that they were guilty, but I thought, this is a crazy hook for a film. To follow a murder trial where that's the defense, like this is a great arc, so we should follow it. And then it just uh, got weirder and more surreal over the two and a half years of making it, and more and heavier because then we started to understand that these women might not be guilty. Yeah, it's fascinating that you mentioned the surrealness of it all because there's literally an episode uh, from Veronica Mars season one, which follows a similar plot point where a character is tricked into crime by being duped by a sort no. of fake scenario, right? And on paper, it sounds so incredibly outlandish. How did you tackle trying to dive in and accurately represent all the complexities and all the wildness of this story to the audience? Like, how do you even begin to, to try and portray that to an audience? First of all, I had no idea I ripped off Veronica Mars. So <laughs> I've never seen that show, but I love Kristen Bell. I hope they don't come after me, but- I feel uh, like, like it. There's a real like investigation sort of like through line that would- Yeah, I think, I think I would like it. I'd like to think she would like this movie and not sue me. So. <laughs> It's a great question because it is such a sensational story on face value, right? That is the hook. The idea that there could be two female assassins, this reality show defense, one of the women wearing an LOL sweatshirt 
it's so surreal and absurd and bizarre on its face value that I felt like we actually had to rein that in, in the filmmaking, in the sense that I didn't want to inject any sensationalism into the film minus the facts because they were already sensational enough. So to me, the making of Assassins was all about stripping that down. And we were constantly, you know, we're, we're filmmakers, we're, we're documentary filmmakers. And so, uh, you know, so much of our schooling is about the ethics of filmmaking. And I love that about my team. They're constantly questioning me as a director or each other about the ethics of what we're doing. And so there were many arguments, um, you know, uh, intellectual arguments, uh, friendly arguments in the edit room, in the production offices around what we were doing and what our story was. And the, the constant sort of anchor or guiding star, I would say, that we would always revert back to is our film is about who are these two women and what led them to this moment where they touch Kim Jong-nam's face? And if we can answer that question in the film, despite how alluring everything else is, the assassination itself, all of the sensationalism, you know, the sort of Game of Thrones-esque aspect of the Kim regime, which is so fascinating. But like, if we're always anchored in that and not getting caught up um, in the sensationalism of that, like really understanding what led these women to this moment, whether they're guilty or innocent, that's what we want the trajectory of the film to be. So that's my, that's my huge hope is the takeaway of Assassins. And, you know, some might argue that's a boring take on this story, but to me that, that would be the only way I felt comfortable making it. I mean, of course we have a few sections about prank shows that are very funny and, uh, you know, the CCTV, I think, is very terrifying and chilling um, and, you know, sensational because, but it's real. Uh, but ultimately, we wanted to be very rooted in that, that human tale of who, of who they both are. Yeah, 100%. I, I want to get to the CCTV footage in a minute, um, because I think that's a really interesting wrinkle to, to it all. But I'm really interested to hear that Doug was the one to approach you about making a documentary um, based on this story. And I'm even more interested knowing that it's because of The Keepers, which is a documentary series I'm a massive fan of. And I think it has real empathy and humanity at its core because of the two women who are investigating that long unsolved murder, but also because of the people around it who are so impacted by that and they're so emotional about that story, even all those decades later. And on paper, Assassins and the Keepers seem so different story-wise, but yet at the same time, it is two women at the core of the story and people who are uncovering something really unexpected as well. Have you had that kind of feedback from people who are familiar with your work that they are maybe surprised about this film coming from you or that they can really understand that emotional core that links something like The Keepers, but even The Case Against A and uh, Invisible and Assassins as well. Yeah, I mean, it's not like I have a ton of fans who are telling me the overlap that they see in all my stories. So I can't really <laughs> speak for other people saying, you know, like, oh, I know I saw this and I'll send you the newsletter. I'll send you it. It's my mom and sister, right? Yeah. Uh, but I would say, you know, what was interesting was especially seeing the way the women from the Keepers reacted to assassins, because I would argue both both are, you know, the genre of true crime, the subgenre of documentary, the, the true crime aisle has become extremely popular in the last five years. And that's that's a great thing. And that's a dangerous thing, I think. And what I hope we did with both uh, because both, I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue that neither are true crime, but what I hope we did with both was we used um, something, a murder, uh, to draw an audience in and then show them things that they didn't want to look at or that they didn't come, that they didn't arrive there for. And I heard that a lot because The Keepers was so popular just from, from measuring it on the internet. That's sort of, you know, if I simmered the the one reaction down to the keepers that I saw on Twitter over the years, it was like, wow, that was not what I signed up for. <laughs> um, 
And I hope Assassins is a little similar in that sense, in that, you know, I think so much of the story became not about the assassination and instead about this sort of universal story, universal current of the exploitation of young people and especially young women around the world. So like, ultimately, like if you told me to, to encapsulate assassins in a, in a log line about what the takeaway is, I would argue that it's a cautionary tale about the dangers of uh, social media and the internet and the dark web and perhaps this is the most extreme sensational version of how someone can be exploited or manipulated uh, via those channels, but that this is a story that's happening worldwide. So it's very easy, and it, I, did, I was guilty of this too. I mean, I was guilty of this while making the film. It's very easy to otherize Dwan and Siti um, because they look like assassins and you, we all just assumed they were guilty from the beginning. It's a very different story when you start microscopically understanding how they got to that point. And you're like, wow, this is the story that's happening all over the world in all different cultures of people, you know, seeking 15 minutes of fame as it was for Duan or seeking a better life and a better paycheck like Siti was for her, you know, sending money back to her son. And when you start to look at when I started to look at assassins through that lens, to me, it became much less a true crime story and much more, you know, a, a human story, um, a story of, of socioeconomics and, um, you know, the, the, the humanity of, uh, and, and dehumanizing that can happen via those, those, um, those channels. Mm. Yeah, it is really fascinating watching the documentary because you do lead the audience down this garden path for the first sort of 15, 20 minutes and then take a hard pivot when you suddenly go back and retell the story that you had first told them looking at those details. And a big tool for doing that is the CCTV footage. And I was wondering, because there is such a wealth of it, how do you go about curating all of that footage and deciding what pieces are important for you to show and what pieces are going to be crucial for, for showing the viewer and telling that narrative? Well, I'm so glad you asked that because we documentary directors get way too much credit for authorship of our films. <laughs> there are so many collaborators that I work with and often it's the same people on all of my films or series. Uh, that plays such a huge role in what the final product becomes. And I, the only part of the CCTV I can take credit for is getting my hands on it, because we spent years trying to get access to that CCTV footage and we're constantly stonewalled by the Malaysian police or the, the, the prosecution. Um, and I can't say how we finally got our hands on it, but we finally did. And once we did, it's literally me bringing back a plastic bag of shady DVDs to Los Angeles and dumping it in my editing team's room and saying, well, supposedly this is all the CCTV from the airport the day. Who knows if the person that gave it to me is lying and it's full of viruses and we're all gonna have the North Koreans in our, in our phones after this, but have at it. And my editing team spent months, I think three months piecing together all of that footage because it was thousands of hours of footage from, I don't know, dozens of cameras from around the airport. So you're talking about one of the busiest international airports in the world and having to look at every camera from that airport. And basically, it's like, where's Waldo? It's like finding the same six people, the same six Waldos throughout the day, the two women and the four North Korean spies and tracing their steps. And so uh, my associate editor, not even our lead editor, uh, Darshan Kambavi, that was basically his full-time job for three months, was like laying out the timeline of all six people. And I think it was such a huge uh, endeavor and it was such a huge achievement on his uh, part because those were the moments where we started to have our eyes open to the those were the holy shit moments like oh we're making this film because it because it was a crazy story and whether the women were telling the truth or lying we knew it was going to be you know a good arc 
But this CCTV footage is corroborating everything both women are saying. Like it's one thing for them to spin some narrative of this is how it all went down and we thought it was a prank show, but then to get to watch that proven in the footage changed everything. Not change everything even for the film, change everything ethically for us as filmmakers because then we've started thinking, holy shit, these women look like they're innocent and yet they're about to be executed because that was the likelihood. Everybody on the ground was telling us, oh, these women are gonna be executed and the, fur the further the trial went on for people that have seen the film, uh, you know, the more likely it looked that it was heading in that direction. So it was like, oh shit, they're innocent and yet they're gonna be executed. Can we even, can we even make a film about, like who wants to watch that? Is that ethical to even put out in the world? Um, so that changed everything and thank God that's not how the story evolved as, as people know, thank God it had those final curveballs at the end. But the work my editing team to put that together was like the huge, holy shit, like heavy moment. Like this is not what we thought we had signed up for because it totally corroborates everything that these women have been saying. Yeah, I really didn't think it was going to have the happy ending that it did uh, eventually. Like that was that was really unexpected and really rewarding because uh, like you said, it really doesn't feel like it's going to hit that way for a long time. Uh, my last question for you is what is the last great piece of nonfiction that you consumed, whether it's another documentary, a podcast, a feature article? It's gonna be a documentary because that's all I do with my free time besides making my own films is watch uh, documentaries. Although I, I, I have I have read a couple great things lately, but uh, my I usually have one documentary every year that I just become so in love with and obsessed with and can't stop talking about. And, and 2020 was no different. And I don't know if it really made its way over to Australia, but it's on Amazon, so everyone can watch it. It's an Amazon film. It's called Time. Have you heard of it? No, I haven't. Um, I think it's going to be a front runner for the Oscar, but it is an amazing film. It's black and white. It's very quiet, but it's about um, a black family in the U.S. Um, where the parents were incarcerated when they were young in their 20s, committed a crime. Um, and the mom's let out of prison and she filmed herself raising, um, I think it's four sons, uh, while the dad was still in prison. And so the premise is very simple, but it's a gorgeous, poetic, but very narratively heavy film. So I can't stop talking about it because I think uh, Garrett Bradley, the director, is such an amazing talent and it, you know, it was at Sundance last year and Amazon bought it. So it's not like it was so under the radar that it's a documentary that's getting no attention. Um, but I hope all of your, uh, anyone watching this will, will queue it up on Amazon because it, it like blew my mind. It's very quiet, but it's, it's, it's gorgeous and it's a very slow burn. Well, there's a recommendation from Ryan White himself. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you so much for talking about assassins and being so generous with your time. Oh yeah, it was my pleasure. Thank you.